webinar on comorbid mental health conditions in veterans, strategies for assessment, case formulation, and treatment. And it's being delivered as part of MHPN's inaugural online conference, Working Better Together. A very warm welcome to all of you who've joined us tonight for the live activity. And I should say that we've had around 3,500 registrations for this stream of the conference, the military mental health uh, stream of the conference. And that's an incredible number. And I think um, it's testament really to just how important this uh, topic is for us as clinicians. Uh, welcome also to those of you who are joining us later on a recording. And of course, a very warm welcome to our panel, who I will introduce in just a moment. First, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands across Australia upon which our panel and our participants are located. And I'd like to pay our respects to their elders, past, present, and future. My name is Mark, Mark Creamer. I'm a clinical psychologist in private practice and also a professor in Spartan Psychiatry at the University of Melbourne. And I've had a very long interest in the mental health effects of trauma, and particularly in veteran and military mental health. And as a clinician, I am constantly, uh, I guess, struck by how complex some of my veteran clients are and uh, just what a challenge it is to work with them. And so uh, I'm very pleased tonight to be able to facilitate this panel and to pick the brains of our expert panelists. So without further ado, let me introduce them. You've all had their bios, and so I'll keep it very, very brief. First, I'd like to introduce Kate Howell. Joining us tonight from rural, rural Victoria, Kate is a very experienced general practitioner. Uh, she's also a therapist, a, an educator, and an author, and has written five books on mental health and counseling. She started her career in the RAAF and now works as a GP at Puckapunyal Army Base. So she is very, very well qualified to be joining us tonight. Welcome, Kate. Thank you for, for being here. Pleasure. Uh, it often strikes me that we, we do tend to work in an area that can be quite stressful, so I'm always interested to know what people do to get away from work. Uh, what do you do to relax? Well, I, like, I guess I'm a bit more introverted by nature, so I quite enjoy just walking the dog, reading a book, reading the newspaper, having a coffee. Um, but I, I actually work and live part of the time in Victoria. You'll see the suitcases behind me. I regularly go back to Adelaide, which is my original home, and I live near the coast there, so I catch up with my friends and enjoy the beach. Right, yeah, okay. So that must be interesting, actually changing location on a regular basis. Every week, I suppose. No, no, I actually stay here for three, uh, and then go back to Adelaide, yeah, for a week, three days. Yeah, um, right. All right. Thank you very much, Kate. Uh, our next panelist is John Finch, uh, joining us from here in Melbourne tonight. John is a clinical psychologist specializing in PTSD. He started his career working with veterans and serving personnel and their families in the VVCS, what we now call Open Arms, and uh, since then has worked with a number of organizations, including Davidson Traher, uh, Victoria Police, and Melbourne University Counseling. He's currently in private practice specializing in the treatment of people with complex trauma histories. Welcome, John. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. So uh, let me follow the same theme and perhaps ask you the same question. Uh, what, what kind of things do you do to get away from work and to relax? Uh, well, literally getting away from work, uh, as in leaving it, is on my bicycle most nights, which, oh, yeah. um, which helps me just uh, move my attention away from what I've been doing to something else, because you have to concentrate on the traffic um, to get to the bike path. But then you, you have a little bit of uh, um, relaxation, if you like, uh, and uh, sometimes out in nature a bit, depending on which way I go. Uh, uh, I find that that's useful. Absolutely. I quite agree. That idea of having a, uh, a, a very clear break from work, I think, is really useful, isn't it? I, I, when I was working full time, I always used to ride my bike home, and I found it was a great way of uh, Thank you, John. Thank you. Uh, our final uh, panel member tonight is Mary Frost, who's joining us tonight from Darwin. Uh, Mary started her career as a GP uh, before later going on to train and qualify as a psychiatrist. In her clinical practice in Darwin, she specializes in the assessment and treatment 
of serving members and veterans, and of course there's a lot of serving members and veterans in the Darwin area. She also uh, has an academic position at Flinders University and is involved in teaching medical students. Welcome, Mary. Thanks very much for joining us tonight. Uh, I, every, I should say that everybody here is complaining of the cold, certainly in Melbourne, and uh, I gather that on the chat room as well people are complaining of it, but presumably you're basking in beautiful sunshine, are you? <laughs> I don't know you're going to find a lot of sympathy here, but still. Uh, let me just follow up uh, the same question I asked the others, because I've heard a rumor about you. Uh, talking about what people do to relax, I understand that you're something of a musician. That's correct, yeah. I play a stringed instrument, the viola, and I play in the Darwin Symphony Orchestra. And so through the Darwin Symphony Orchestra, we give concerts, we go on tour. Uh, sometimes we're asked to do um, small group gigs at places like Government House, and it's a lovely way to be part of... Um, a really enjoyable community that I've now lived in for 20 years. So, yeah, it's taken me many places, both within Darwin and within the Territory. So I love that's it. wonderful. And, and there is something special about making music with other people, isn't there? I reckon that's... Oh, uh, yes. Yeah. Yes. yeah. Very special. Very good, very good for the brain. Absolutely, yes. Absolutely. Okay, well, thank you very much, Mary. Thank you to all our panellists. Let me uh, just, if I could, uh, spend a few seconds talking about some tech stuff for our participants. Um, we've got a chat box. If you just click on the open chat box, you can post comments uh, to the group there. Uh, there's a supporting resources tab, a resources library, uh, with a whole range of stuff around tonight's uh, webinar. I would perhaps encourage you not to look at it now, uh, but rather MHPN will send you a link to access all of those resources, and you can go through them at your leisure. Uh, there's a technical support tab if you get stuck for some FAQs there, and uh, we would encourage you, please, in the exit survey, to give us your feedback on how you found this platform uh, and whether you like it or not. Uh, but for now, I'd like to, um, I've forgotten to forward the, the slide to the title, but anyway, you know the title. Uh, for now, I'd like to uh, just say something about the webinar series. So this um, DVA actually commissioned MHPN to deliver a series of 14 webinars on veteran and military mental health. Uh, this is the 12th, so there are, will be another two before the end of the year. And previous ones have looked at topics like PTSD and anger, uh, sleep, um, substance use, and so on. And if you missed any of those and you'd like to catch up on them, they're all available on the MHPN website as well as on the DVA at ease website. So you can look at them there. But tonight's webinar is looking at the issues raised by working with very complex cases uh, with, with multiple conditions. And so when we use the shorthand of comorbidities, we're really talking about people who have multiple diagnoses. And we're going to be using a case vignette, Tom, uh, as a kind of jumping off point. Uh, you've all had an opportunity to read the vignette, I hope, and uh, I'm sure that it rings some bells for many of you. Uh, two weeks ago, we talked about Tom uh, as he was just about to leave the military, leave the Defence Force. Uh, but tonight we're going to go forward two years and we're going to look at how he's coping now two years down the track and the issues raised by that. So we'll use Tom's case as a kind of jumping off point. Each of our panelists will give a brief five-minute presentation uh, from their unique perspective about Tom. And then we'll open it up for a more general discussion and questions, which will take up the bulk of the time. So I think, um, oh yes, I better just talk about the... Uh, the learning objectives. Uh, by the end of all that, we hope that uh, you will, I guess, be better able to recognize the, the risk indicators, the warning signs, the protective factors for these complex clinical cases, that you'll be better able to, to describe the uh, evidence-based assessment, formulation, treatment approaches most effective for this population, and that as a result of both of those two, uh, you'll have more confidence in identifying and supporting veterans with psychiatric uh, comorbidities, and also I hope that we'll t have a t an opportunity to take it a little bit further and also look at the complexities when we have uh, physical and mental health conditions occurring together. 
So I think at that point, uh, I will uh, hand over to our first panelist, Kate, uh, to talk a little bit about her perspective on Tom's case from a GP perspective. Kate, uh, I'll hand over to you. Thank you. All right, so when I read the story of Tom, it certainly many facets of it resonated with me, you know, both from my experience within uh, working with current army members, but also as a GP in the community. And I thought Tom might respond to his wife's ultimatum um, by actually heading off to a GP potentially. Now, he may have stayed away from GPs uh, in the two years. I'm not sure, but um, certainly the GP will need to focus on trying to build a relationship. Um, potentially, that could be challenging given uh, Tom is male and is a veteran and he's dealing with a whole range of issues on his own and has done so for quite a while. And I'm sure there's a strong influence of a sense of shame for him that perhaps has held him back all the way through of accessing some help and support. I think for GPs um, and other health professionals, it's really important to get a good understanding of military and veteran health. Um, that, you know, I spent the day at um, Pakapanil today, and you know, I saw I saw a man who was very reluctant to access help, and it was a very challenging consult. But I think if we understand to a degree where they're coming from, it helps to respond with listening and empathy, and it will take some time and care, and that can be a challenge in a busy general practice as well. So there's been a lot going on for Tom over a number of years and the GP will need to try and unpack some of the background and story and the, the key symptoms and issues and that may take um, several consults. Because there are a, a range of complex issues, you do want to explore uh, what's going on physically for him uh, physical health and functioning. Um, we heard about musculoskeletal issues, which are a very common uh, problem in veterans, and there may be chronic pain. So certainly before serving members who've been in the military for quite a while, before they leave, we often see that they have chronic ankle problems, chronic knee problems, or hip, or low back, or neck, or shoulders. Um, so it's not surprising Tom's got some issues. But also all the, the mental health side of things, mood, anxiety, uh, exposure to trauma. We've heard Tom um, has been drinking more to sleep, irritability with children, anger issues. And um, you know, just try and explore exactly what's going on in the many facets of Tom's life um, with family and partner and so on. We want to explore whether there are any social connections or supports that may be helpful, uh, what resources are available to Tom, whether he's aware of any or whether he's tapping into any at this point, probably not. Always a mental state examination and uh, always want to assess suicidal and homicidal risk, uh, particularly when someone is struggling with uh, depression long term or PTSD. With reference to the physical illness and the impact of alcohol, you'll be wanting as a GP to do some baseline investigations, examine Tom, check him over, um, check blood pressure, um, check for any signs of um, uh, problems related to alcohol and do a range of blood tests. So that's fairly standard. There is an ADF post-discharge assessment that we can access through Medicare as well as the mental health plan, which may um, be a good way to go with Tom and allow um, some time to thoroughly look at all the issues. Provision of information you know, is the platform that uh, many of us 
use uh, in the start of, at the start of trying to work with um, a patient or client and, and trying to um, gauge what Tom understands, what knowledge he already has, and um, uh, I guess think in terms of biopsychosocial um, and potentially spiritual aspects for some people in terms of how issues are caused but also um, management. And um, so education can then lead into looking at uh, what the next steps might be in terms of some help. I think when we talk with Tom, you know, when we read the case, we heard him using quite a few negative statements about himself, that he was of no use, of no value, a loser. And so we need to be mindful of that and uh, supportive and foster some uh, sense of hope um, within him uh, that he can feel better and that he can um, contribute to family and community in the longer term. Over time, um, a GP will hopefully look at aspects of lifestyle with Tom, particularly um, the benefits of good nutrition and exercise, his struggling with sleep, so looking at that, and very much looking at small steps uh, to improving lifestyle and small steps with reference to social connection or engaging in some sort of media, meaningful activity over time. It's very hard for veterans when they leave. Um, you know, they've done a particular range of activities in the military and had a lot of social connection with their uh, fellow soldiers and mates. And to find something in the community that has that sense of purpose and meaning, you know, can be very challenging for them. Part of the process will be referral to mental health practitioners um, and uh, a psychiatry psychiatrist for assessment and management. And um, obviously we have to look at uh, various ways to try and access those um, services. And again, it will depend on how long it takes to access those services. Um, if we assess that Tom may benefit from medication, we may well start on that process. Um, if we can access um, further assessment very quickly, um, we may hand over to the a psychiatrist that um, they're saying. But Tom's got quite a few signs that mood is deteriorating, so we will want to get onto things as soon as possible and collaborate with other mental health practitioners. It's very important to make sure um, safety plans are in place, that follow-up is organised and that we do monitor Tom for ongoing uh, risk. And, you know, sometimes veterans um, or those in service can deteriorate very quickly. Uh, you know, I've seen people uh, become very unwell over uh, days and need inpatient treatment. So always be mindful that may be needed. Our role may also be in advocacy, uh, assisting Tom to make um, claims with DVA for treatment support or uh, compensation over time and um, encouraging access to resources. Lovely. Thank you very much, Kate. There's a, a whole wealth of issues there that uh, I'm sure we'll pick up on in the discussion. Just briefly, um, I guess that Tom is going to need to engage uh, with DVA, uh, particularly around his mental health claim. Do you ever find that, that some veterans are reluctant to engage with DVA? Is this a bit of a hurdle for some of them? Um, for some, yes. For many, they uh, prior to uh, separating from the military, they will work through the DVA application process with support of DVA advocates and the doctors within um, defence. Uh, but if someone has, um, I suppose, resentment around the military or anything associated with the military, um, or, for example, shame around a mental health condition versus a physical condition, that may deter them from uh, making a claim. Yeah, sure. Okay, thank you very much indeed, Kate. Let's uh, move on now and hear something of a, psychology, a psychology perspective from John. 
Uh, can I hand over to you, John, to talk a little bit about uh, a clinical psychology perspective? Okay, thank you, Mike. <clears throat> um, so from the, the clinical psychology perspective, we're, we're looking at trying to aim for a good diagnosis for um, for the uh, for Tom um, and what we're looking at when we're looking at this is that uh, we have um, sorry I'm just noticing I'm coming back on here I was off air for a second there so when we're looking at uh, trying to aim for a good diagnosis in inverted commas a diagnosis that can help us look at uh, Tom's experience and understand it from a, a clinical and diagnostic perspective there are a lot of uh, issues that Tom is presenting with that actually could be many things. So we've got things that are depressive symptoms, PTSD symptoms and anxiety symptoms and as you can see in the slide things like anger, irritability, shame, sleep, substance use, his pain as not necessarily a um, diagnostic uh, category for any of those disorders but something that complicates the presentation of those disorders and interacts with those disorders and um, those disorders interact with pain as well. Things like his relationship and personality factors are all things that we want to consider in terms of trying to understand what is Tom's presentation and how might we best uh, help Tom to move forward from what's going on for him. Now some of the uh, the reasons as to why we might use an evidence-based assessment are that when we're thinking about uh, an evidence-based assessment and someone fitting into a diagnostic category that's something to do with how we understand that disorder across place and time in terms of I could be talking about something like PTSD here in Australia and in America we'll know that we're talking about the same thing and that can actually help us inform treatment from different, different perspectives. Part of um, that is that we can look at when we assess for trauma, we are looking at not just um, the immediate sort of things that are going on for the client in terms of their history to do with the military, where we're also assessing for those things like depression and other things, but their life history in particular for PTSD. We want to know about a range of traumas and whether they are pre-existing traumas. We also want to know about uh, pre-existing issues that might be related, relating to depressive or anxiety symptoms. Now some of the things that can help us assess that are screening measures and screening measures help us uh, understand how someone may fit into a particular diagnosis and on uh, the slide there you can see that I've got the LEC5. The LEC5 is a screening measure which actually just assesses all the different types of traumas that people have had. It's linked with PTSD and assessing the number of and type of traumas, whether it's from a natural disaster, military service, whether it's a motor vehicle accident, whether it's sexual assault, which of course all of those things could be traumas that someone in the military could have suffered that are not just specific to the military. Um, the PCL5 is a measure of PTSD that's brief, it's 20 questions just based on PTSD symptoms. The PHQ9 is a screening for depression, uh, nine short questions, and the GAD7 is a screening for generalised anxiety disorder. And these can help us refine what we might um, look at when we're looking at someone at their first presentation. And then a structured measure such as the CAPS-5 is a clinician-administered PTSD scale which is a much longer form of assessment that looks at PTSD specifically but there are also those for depression and anxiety. And all of this helps us make choices around uh, treatment and in particular evidence-based treatment in terms of what might work. And evidence-based assessment when we know okay the person may be suffering from PTSD or depression or anxiety helps us make choices around um, evidence-based treatment. The evidence-based 
treatment idea is important in terms of the research helps us understand the uh, effect of the treatment and, and whether it is effective or not. Um, I like to think of it in terms of most of us might uh, go to our GP, try the medications there, and if we had tried lots and lots of different medications, we might consider alternatives that may not have an evidence base, but we might give them a try to see what happened. Um, the research idea around um, therapy and treatment and how it works is a, a significant factor with the choice for evidence-based therapies in that uh, it will help us. We know a lot about how a particular therapy works when we've done the research. So we know, for example, that um, in terms of the particular therapy that I focus on, cognitive processing therapy, that if family members uh, support the person to face traumatic memories going through PTSD, that actually the therapy works better. We know that the research around evidence-based therapy also tells us that actually short-term therapies can actually work. Um, we also know that uh, the longer therapy tends to stretch out, that the less effective it is and that there's more and more research showing with both prolonged exposure therapy and um, cognitive processing therapy, two of the main evidence-based therapies for PTSD, that the more those therapies are frequent rather than stretched out, the better the outcomes. We also know that the research tells us that um, men, women, veterans, non-veterans, a whole variety of people will respond to uh, evidence-based therapies. The research is actually showing that. In particular for PTSD, another important factor is that um, uh, comorbid depression, when uh, treated um, in the context of PTSD, if we treat the PTSD first, then the depression often shifts as well. So we don't have to focus on one or the other. And that's where uh, that evidence-based therapy and the research behind it is a really useful um, tool for us as clinicians. Okay. Great. Thank you very much, John. I think that's your last slide, isn't it? Yep, that's my last slide. Yep. I think it is. Yes, thank you very much for that. And I do want to pick up uh, down the track a bit more about evidence-based treatment because it's going to be central to what we're talking about. But um, before I do it, I was interested in Tom's comment about somebody owes me. And I'm wondering whether you've got any thoughts about whether or not this is a, a sort of common attitude, whether it's more typical among veterans than other people. Uh, but this perhaps sense of entitlement, not unjustified necessarily, but this idea that someone owes me. Have you got any comments on that? Yes, I, I would say that it is a, it is a um, uh, not, not just common to, to military, but common to what we might term first responders. So we're looking at ambulance, fire brigade, SES and police members, where they're in a culture where they give a lot, they put their life on the line at times, and part of that culture is that you will be looked after. And so when that looking after is something that is uh, not for coming forth with in, in their eyes, it can sometimes come across as, well, why aren't I getting what I was promised? And uh, of course, at the same time, you can have some people who actually think they are entitled to these things in a way that um, might be different to, to other members within those sort of uh, subcultures, I guess. So yeah, I would very much think it is uh, very much part of that, that culture and that you, you don't find the average person in the street who might have a trauma having that kind of idea that somebody needs to respond. And often they might have that idea if somebody owes them, but at the same time they don't want to accept that, that treatment. They want to be part of the group, but independent as well. Yeah, and I, I do want to come back to that idea of, of sort of ambivalence about treatment uh, in just a minute. But yeah, look, thank you very much for that. I think it is interesting. And of course, veterans are entitled to a whole lot of services, and we mustn't lose sight of that. It's a question of whether, when, and whether that attitude kind of um, becomes counter-therapeutic or gets in the way of treatment. But thank you very much, John. We'll pick up on some of those in a minute. For now, let's move on to Mary and see if we can get a, a psychiatry perspective on Tom's case. Uh, over to you, Mary. 
Okay, thanks, Mark. Um, look, as the other speakers have already touched on, I think we're facing a number of potential diagnostic considerations here. And as a psychiatrist, that's going to be an important part of my um, assessment of Tom, but also form the basis of treatment. And the, the four areas that I have have concerns around a post-traumatic stress disorder, we've heard that he's easily startled, waits at the gym, um, the, noise of, the noise of weights at the gym. We've heard he's not sleeping well, that his partner is noticing how disturbed his sleep is. Uh, we know he's had traumatic exposure about which he doesn't want to talk. And uh, he also speaks of the cry of his children as sounding like triggering memories of uh, time in the Middle East. Um, the depression, I think Kate's pretty well touched on deteriorating mood, sleep and so on. The alcohol use disorder uh, I'm quite concerned about because not only uh, is it something that he's using to try and numb symptoms and detach himself, but it's also something that uh, is there genetically in his background with his father's death from liver disease when Tom was aged five, uh, sorry, 15. Um, and then the diagnosis of chronic pain I'm not really making um, because I don't fully understand it at this stage and that is something that would require me to collaborate with the GP um, to get better understanding of, of what's happening from a musculoskeletal perspective. Um, before I even start to treat Tom, I think it's really important to be aware of the context of his treatment. So we know he lives in a regional town near Townsville. Not that he lives in Townsville, but that he lives in a small town near Townsville. So most treatment is likely to take place in Townsville, which means he's got to get there. Um, there's a scarcity of specialised resources in Townsville, in Darwin, in most regional centres. Um, that means that there's an inevitable difficulty in accessing psychiatric services, which often means that GPs tend to be uh, the primary source of mental health care with psychiatric appointments being more kind of consultant, uh, having a sort of consultant rather than treatment role. Um, and obviously if he's not working, his wife is, um, and he then has to start travelling regularly to uh, Townsville, then that's going to make um, demands on, on family life, which needs to be taken into consideration. Um, Sorry, my mouse just won't let me, yep. Okay, so thinking in a broader sense about um, Tom's presentation, I fall back on a formulation and think about things like biological, psychological, social um, contributors to his current predicament. I'm concerned about his father's death from alcohol use when Tom was age 15. I'm concerned about Tom's own alcohol use. Uh, his pain and physical disability and whether or not he's using analgesics, um, either prescribed or non-prescribed, although these days with um, prescriptions for so over-the-counter over -the codeine being less um, available, that seems to have diminished some of the, um, the role of unprescribed, non-prescribed um, analgesics. I do wonder, we don't know a lot about Tom's background, but his father died when he was age 15. His mother died a few years later. Does he actually have a trauma history um, in that setting of family dysfunction? His father's unavailability, um, his, his mother's perhaps submission to a, a drinking dad and walking on eggshells, as I hear from a lot of my military members. Um, and so Tom, as a young man, decided that he really needed a different kind of family. He was seeking a father figure. And he joined the army. He then uh, also um, kind of attached himself to his partner's uh, father, Bruce, and now feels that he's failing Bruce. And so that's a significant loss. He's already lost his own dad, and now he feels like he's letting his other father figure down, having lost his family, the army. And he talks about he was a hero, and now he's a loser. So there's, there's this considerable loss of role and identity and grief. Um, I'm also concerned, as is very often the case with veterans and military members, that their reluctance to seek help um, characterises a lot of their psychological battles, or else they come in the throes of a marriage that's about to end. 
at which point you're not quite sure of their own motivation for help. Um, we know that he's isolated, he's living remotely. Um, I'm concerned about Sonia's mental health. Again, we don't know much about that, but she has been prescribed sleeping pills. He's using her sleeping pills. He's very detached from the family. He worries about the children's crying. Um, Sonia's clearly indicated that she's finding him tough going. And the in-laws, which previously were a, a source of great support for him, he's also distanced himself from. And in that setting, suicide starts to become uh, a real concern for me. So, you know, in thinking about safety, I'm thinking about Tom's safety, his risk of suicide. I'm thinking about his anger and, and the children and, and Sonia. I'm worried about his alcohol consumption and, and possibly his use of analgesics, uh, illicit substances and so on. Um, and then the physical comorbidities, which I'll, I'll leave um, Kate covered those well earlier. So like Kate, um, I think the Therapeutic Alliance is slow, cautious, and requires a lot of patience on the part of the practitioner because he's told us he's ambivalent about treatment. He's told us he's reluctant to attend. So I think if we impose a model too prematurely on, on Tom, he'll run. So um, you know, sometimes in this setting, and I think there are a variety of approaches, if, if Sonia is the one that's declared the ultimatum to his help seeking, then I might start fairly early by involving her. Um, sometimes reminding Tom of his desire to be a good father figure uh, means that I sort of establish the therapeutic alliance by reminding him of being a dad. And there's a lot of mention of the children. And sometimes in, in veterans, they become the primary caregiver. And, and I actually meet children. They come to appointments. Um, so the children can sometimes be a way in. As Kate's already mentioned, um, there are a number of symptoms that need to be targeted. Um, and she and I, the, the list we have is, is virtually identical. Um, and I don't want to go a lot into biological treatment, but I think it's important to mention that benzodiazepines shouldn't be used because this is a fellow that's already drinking excessively. Uh, that the evidence around SSRI antidepressants is, is mixed, but is probably there. And there are a number of other range, uh, agents used in the treatment of PTSD, which I won't go through. The, the final and I think most important thing in the management of Tom is the, the need for collaboration. Uh, he has complex comorbidities. And uh, if he were in the military, I would indirectly be knowing about his musculoskeletal status through a physio. Not that I'd be contacting the physio, but I'd be hearing from the GP about what the physio thinks about his musculoskeletal status. So that's the sort of level that I think as a psychiatrist, I need to have some awareness of, um, of the complexity. Thank you very much indeed, Mary. And again, um, a whole lot of points that we'll pick up on uh, in the course of our discussion there. Um, but I would like to just touch on that last point. And you, you kind of ended slightly more, you know, perhaps more optimistically than I would, um, this idea of, uh, of the importance of us collaborating amongst ourselves as professionals around a particular case. Do you think we're, we're generally reasonably good at that? Or do you think it happened? Um, look, I think it depends on. Um us individually, some of us are, I think, by nature collaborators, and some of us tend to sort of row the boat a bit, a bit uh, as a solo, um, as a solo oarsman. But I've always really enjoyed collaboration, and I think um, working in a multidisciplinary setting, which I can't do as a private psychiatrist, means that I actually reach out a lot to, particularly the psychologists that um, also treat the patients that I'm seeing, and the GPs. Um, and without that, um, I feel much more pessimistic about treatment. But I think when others are contributing, it makes me feel that um, there can be some kind of like division of the pie. And uh, I can focus on this area, knowing that somebody else is monitoring analgesics or checking liver function tests in the case of alcohol. So yeah, I think it's really important. Yeah, I, I certainly agree that it, that it is very important. And, um, I'm just not sure that it always happens as much as it should, but uh, but I, I certainly agree with the importance. And it's up to each yeah. of us, I suppose, to, to make sure that we do. We do, we do communicate and don't mm. necessarily wait for others to contact us. Anyway, thank you very much, Mary. Thank you indeed to all our panelists for those presentations. Very enlightening. 
I'd like to now kick off the broader discussion. And uh, I'm going to invite the panel members to just jump in uh, and, uh, and add alternative perspectives or disagree if they want to. But I, I will direct questions at each of them. And I should say that I've been very impressed by the number and the quality of questions that we've received from the participants and indeed are continuing to receive. And we will try to get through as many of those as possible, but uh, we have very limited time. So please bear with us if we don't get to your particular question. But let's kick it off with something that, that I think all our, our panelists mentioned. And I'm going to turn to you, Kate, if I could, to, to start with, because you made a particular point about um, the importance of engaging Tom in a therapeutic relationship and some of the challenges that that might uh, bring up for you. So um, I guess, yeah, I'm wondering really whether you think it's more difficult to engage veterans in treatment than it is other populations. Kate. Uh, I think it varies. Um, certainly with Tom, it sounds like it would be, um, you'd have to work fairly hard and make sure that you get him back. Um, sometimes sometimes I rem a thing that helps me is sort of looping back. If, I, if I'm finding a bit of a resistance or he doesn't want to talk about something, putting it on the shelf in my mind and coming back to it later, it might be later that session or later in, a, in another appointment. But you know, certainly um, there are, there's a lot more openness in the military around mental health issues, for example, and a lot more support uh, than in years gone by. So a lot of uh, people who are leaving the military have already had treatment for mental health issues, have uh, accessed DVA, etc. So it, it is a bit individual. Um, you will always get those individuals who uh, perceive that a mental health issue in particular is um, represents weakness, um, and their concern is that other soldiers will will put them in the basket of you know that soldier's broken because they're weak, um, and yeah. they're not my words; they're words from soldiers I work with. Yeah, absolutely, and certainly um, there's a clear ambivalence, I guess, with Tom, which is is, is perhaps born out uh, of, of that. Um, military culture in part, perhaps, and also part of part, part his own personality. Um, I guess I'm wondering whether, uh, well, perhaps I'll move on to John. Um, do you, John, have any tips for us about how you would go about engaging someone like, um, like Tom in treatment? Uh, in terms of uh, uh, someone like Tom, things like knowing the military language can be really helpful. Uh, you know, where he has a sense of this person understands him. Uh, so uh, you can find you can find lists of, of military language. Um, you know, something knowing something like what a grunt is, for example, might actually, which is an infantry soldier, might actually help engage Tom to to see that you understand some of his perspective. Uh, a time a time sort of factor is also often part of the situation. Uh, and also, I guess engaging him in his in his motivation. What what are the reasons? Okay, there's the ultimatum from Sonia, but also you know he's chosen to come in himself rather than just ignore that ultimatum. And, and that working on with that um, motivation and building that can be a really important factor, as well as helping him to understand what the options might be in terms of treatment and that doesn't necessarily have to happen straight away. You can build some trust first, but once um, he does do something, he can actually have change as well. Yeah, yes, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, so let's assume then that, <clears throat> sorry, that, that um, Tom has turned up for treatment. I, I wonder, Mary, if I could turn to you. Uh, you did comment a bit about some of the things you were worried about. Uh, I wonder mm -hmm. if we could just have a, a bit of a, a general chat, both in, in Tom's case and more generally, about what you think are the red flags? What are, what are the kind of warning signs that someone might actually be perhaps on a downward spiral or, or heading for something fairly serious? What, what kinds of things concern you? Well, in the case of Tom, I think um, we, we know that his mental health considerations are actually quite 
I, I won't use the word chronic um, in a sort of chronic psychiatric patient setting, but meaning that some years ago um, he acknowledged that his mental health was compromised and agreed to seek counselling but didn't. That in itself is a red flag that it, it got to a point where he accepted the need for help but didn't follow through and now is following through with possible reluctance or at Sonia's insistence or maybe he's there as John has said because he now wants to be. So, so the actual engagement is, is itself a red flag. The big one is his social isolation. I, I really worry about, um, you know, Kate was talking earlier about the sort of the family of ARMY, the number of peer supports, the number of mates that our serving members have that very quickly drop off the radar once someone is um, discharged. He's living in a remote town, he's not working, he's, he's disengaged from family, he's drinking, he's possibly using analgesics and virtually nothing that's given him meaning or satisfaction is currently working for him. Um, one of the ways I sometimes engage with my veteran and military patients is through their fitness and so I ask them a lot about their physical capacity and their regime at the gym and then talk to them about how that physical discipline we can use we can use the same discipline uh, in a psychological sense but when I hear that somebody has stopped going to the gym or they're going erratically or they're hardly going at all because you know they don't like crowds or they don't like the noise at the gym then that to me is a red flag as well because these are guys who are who've always prided themselves on their physical prowess and you know that very act of being a strong tough soldier um, has formed such a huge part of their identity that many of them try and retain um, once they leave the military and so when they start to lose that that's another red flag and then obviously asking the um, the usual questions about suicidal thoughts, suicidal intent, suicidal planning, protective factors. In his case I think the protective factors are probably um, Sonia and the children but I'm not really sure what other protective factors there are and if Sonia were to leave him I think that that would be um, I concur with Kate that sometimes a, a social a shift in the social dynamic like losing his relationship can suddenly mean somebody's um, at high risk of suicide and, and then I would be thinking about inpatient management. Right, yes, absolutely. Um, if I could turn to you Kate because very often the GP is of course the um, well it's kind of the linchpin that the sort of the, perhaps the case manager for, for want of a better word um, and you talked about the, the post-discharge mental health assessment. My understanding is that there are plans to increase that. I'm not sure if you're aware of that, whether it's been announced yet or I just heard. Did, have you heard of, of plans to increase the number of sessions available to GPs for assessment? I, um, I have heard about it. Um, I haven't uh, gone on a search to um, confirm that. So I probably can't exactly answer that. But, I'm not um, sure that it's gone live yet. I'm not sure that it's yeah. been launched. It's, it's, I think it's imminent, yeah. Yeah, but certainly um, the assessment and also but, you know, utilising the Medicare mental health plan, um, it at least provides uh, more opportunity and um, you know the, the post-discharge assessment is very good in that it's um, quite holistic and looks across physical well-being as well as um, uh, mental health, pain, a whole range of issues. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's um, something we're tapping into. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, just picking up on, on, on one issue that uh, we might want to do some assessment on, and, and you mentioned particularly about the importance of meaningful activity, which I 100% agree with. Um, so in a case like Tom's, how important do you think it is to get him a vocational assessment and to to be looking at perhaps some kind of employment opportunities even if they are very low key? Is that, is that an important thing for someone like him? I think it will be important once um, he's on the path to recovery. It may be a bit early at this stage. But um, before I was a doctor, I was an occupational therapist, so I'm very, oh, really? <laughs> I'm very into um, activities. And you know, it may be 
that again you have to start small and find out from him what has been meaningful in the past and as Mary said it may be well related to fitness it it may be something else you know we don't we don't quite know um, but you know looking for some opportunities based on uh, what he what he says is has been meaningful to him before um, or sometimes reconnecting uh, it may be meaningful for him to reconnect with other veterans through RSL etc so you know part of it's just going to depend on discussion with him and what you identify and I suppose you want to set him up for success by um, by starting with small brief activities um, yeah yeah. Yes, absolutely, absolutely, and and I would I would like to come back to some of that stuff later. If I could turn to you, John, though, um, as part of the assessment, how good do you think we are at um, actually asking the, the the person, the veteran, if you like, what their goals are, um, rather than kind of the formal assessment that you talked about? Do we also need to be asking them what they want out of treatment, what they expect out of treatment? Absolutely, yes. Uh, we need to really look at how how our treatment might move them towards what they want. It's where we're not going to go anywhere if we're not, not working on that. And being able to identify that is, is a really strong key to, to people's success. And uh, is, is, is often a challenge in the, that they, have, they might meet a criteria for something, but that's not what they understand their experience. And in terms of uh, not understanding the experience, they might not understand how that may impact on their life. For example, you know, most often people present to me with uh, a relationship kind of issue that is actually part of a, a previous trauma and it's, it's a, a job for the clinician to integrate, well they want their relationship to be better, what are the things that are, are affecting them and what are their goals with that relationship. So understanding that side of the person's experience is a really important part of why they come in to start with, but also their their success and understanding that you know, I'm withdrawing some things, I'm finding the kids irritable, and but I don't want these things. Well, what is it that's driving those? Yeah, absolutely. And and I guess Tom, like, um, well, certainly like so many of the veterans that that I've come across over my career, is primarily presenting for treatment, not necessarily because he particularly wants to, but because his wife has said she's going to leave him if he doesn't. So he's been pushed into treatment for um, yeah, specific reasons. So I, I take your point that how important it is to really work out, uh, to, to come some collaborative agreement, I suppose, about what we need to work on in treatment. Yeah. Mm. Um, OK, T Tom is presenting with a whole range of um, mental health conditions. That's the nature of our talk tonight. It's about comorbidities. And obviously, we don't have time to go through them all. Um, I would recommend to you, actually, that, that you do go back if you would like to look at the treatment of specific conditions like PTSD or substance use or whatever that you do go back and uh, have a look at the earlier webinars. But I would like to pick up on a couple and, and one that I'd like to start with actually is anger because I think that anger often gets in the way of treatment and perhaps if I could come to you Mary first and just pick up on something that you said about um, safety issues. Um, how concerned do you think we should be Mary with um, uh, I guess with safety issues of his family, of Tom's family, for his wife and children. Look, I think there are a number of um, red flags in relation to the safety of his wife and children. And one is Tom's withdrawal. Um, so Sonia's kind of almost said to him she doesn't want him in the bedroom. He's, a, he's, a, he's another child, he's a burden, uh, she's already got two children, she doesn't need a third, she's spending more time with her family and they've offered to have her live with them. And so I suspect that Tom's anger and irritability is really driving a major wedge between himself and his family. And for him, kind of developmentally, that's really significant because he was a a fellow who lost his dad quite young, lost his mum a few years later, joined the military. So this notion of his own family is, is I would suspect, a very strong value to him. And you know, when we're talking about engagement and um, what are his goals, I suspect one of his goals would well be to re-engage with his family and to preserve his family. So I think his, 
trying to help him manage and modulate and modify that anger is, uh, is going to be a critical part of therapeutic alliance. In saying that, um, I don't think that psychiatrists have a lot of very helpful medications that specifically just target anger. I think we target arousal, anxiety, and then sometimes people say that that makes them less irritable, but it's almost as if that's a kind of spin-off from, um, from modifying uh, anger, so, sorry, by reducing arousal uh, it makes people less angry, but I don't think it's a direct effect on anger. I think most of the medications that psychiatrists have that make people less angry are actually very sedative and then people complain of feeling like a zombie and that's not helpful either because when you're a zombie you don't go to the gym, you don't interact. So yeah, I think it's, it's a, that's a very fine balance from a biological perspective. Absolutely, I quite agree. But let's turn, if I could, to non-biological and perhaps bring you in, Kate. Um, I wonder whether you have any, I don't know, for, any tips for managing angry patients in the consulting room, perhaps for clinicians, and or perhaps what you might be saying to families about how they can, uh, I guess, de-escalate the anger at home and so on. Do you have any, any tips or strategies for people there? Um. I think, um, you know, in terms of in the consulting room, we, uh, you know, in the first instance, we have to be mindful of um, our own safety um, as well as the safety of the, the patient. And, um, you know, earlier today, I was concerned about someone who was escalating and uh, it, in terms of their um, anger with the situation and, I actually brought the consultation to a close. Um, it was appropriate to do so, but I thought I, I just need to sort of contain this by bringing it to a close and, and um, uh, took him out to make the next appointment and to organise um, an appointment with psych the psychologist. So I sort of changed the... the um, I didn't let it run on and on. Um, I mean, obviously, us remaining calm. Um, and, and I think, too, military... Um, our members are used to people, um, you know, even though you're there as a therapist or a doctor, you, you still have a degree of authority. And, a, and I don't use it often, but occasionally, um, you know, you need to be clear in your communication and say, look, this is not okay. We need to calm down, take some breaths. Um, let's just sort of settle things down so we can talk more and actually use that that bit of authority to, to contain the situation. Sure, um, and I guess yeah. setting clear boundaries about what, what is That's and is right. not acceptable behaviour, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and I suppose yeah. with, fa with family um, as well, it's, it's uh, you know, the usual sort of psychoeducation about what's reasonable and what's not, um, and strategies such as um, taking time out or um, breathing or counting to 10. Um, uh, you know, I did have one couple who used the, the stress bucket metaphor so that um, they talked about their own stress bucket, how it was building up, and when they were near the top, they could communicate to the other person, look, my stress bucket's really full, I need to just sort of work on getting that down. Uh, so they were able to share that between them, both of them. Yeah, okay. So having a shared language to kind of communicate about that issue, I think, is yeah, yeah. a very good idea. Um, just while you're there, Kate, I, we've had a number, a few themes coming in on the chat box, and one of them has been a concern that uh, there are long waiting lists for veterans. It's probably hard for you to comment because it depends so much where you are, I suppose, geographically. But do you think that long waiting lists for veterans to get help is a problem? Uh, you know, it certainly can be. It depends a bit on the area. Um, you can, you know, try and prior prioritise the patient if you're really concerned. Um, but yes, I presume this is in relation to open arms or psychiatry or yes, private. Yeah. Yes, exactly. I think, uh, yeah, but all of those yeah. are yeah. 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 So, um, yes, okay, so, so it's the way it is, I guess, and, and uh, yeah, hopefully the waiting list is not too long. Uh, and, and as Mary was saying, some regional areas there really there aren't too many services, 
Um, I suppose you know something to always bear in mind is you know are there um, phone services available either through um, various agencies or with private psychologists, for example, or telehealth psychiatry. Yeah, yes, quite. Okay, let's um, go on if we could and talk a bit about specific kinds of treatments. And um, as I said, you know, we clearly can't go into detail about all the available treatments for multiple conditions, even just for PTSD, actually. But I wonder if, if I could start with you, John, and, um, and ask you literally just to give us one or two sentences and really no more on the key sort of evidence-based treatments. And I suppose I'm thinking CPT, which you mentioned, prolonged exposure, maybe EMDR, just one or two sentences to orientate people as to what they are. Okay, so they're, they're all uh, therapies that have a, num a lot of research behind them, which means we know that they do work. We know how well they work. We also know the factors that make, make them work. Um, they're all relatively short term. They're not years and years. They can be com completed in a matter of months. And um, on average, about two thirds of people will come out of that without a diagnosis. And we, we know that there also is work being done because of the research to actually look at what factors can be um, tweaked, if you like, to try and improve outcome. So I guess evidence-based therapies have, have lots of support and they, they, there's, there's ongoing research, I guess, and that helps us understand how they work and what factors sort of improve or, or potentially uh, make them not work as well, such as the more we space out sessions, for example, we know that yeah. that doesn't work. Yeah, and so really to emphasize the point that I think you really made in your talk, which is that everything else being equal, these really should be our first line treatments in something like PTSD. Absolutely, absolutely. And I suppose in terms of just short, brief, how they work, we know that all of those treatments work by stopping avoidance, which is the key PTSD symptom. Yeah. And, yeah. and they, they deal with that. Yeah, okay. Cognitive and behavioral avoidance, I guess I'm thinking. We're thinking. Yeah, in, in all its forms. <laughs> yeah. In all its forms. Okay, thank you, John. Um, Mary, if I could turn to you and talk about um, meds. You, you spent a bit of time, well, you mentioned very briefly some of the medications you might consider. Um, I guess I'm wondering what might be your, first, I, I guess I'm assuming probably that, that perhaps an SSRI or similar might be one of the first line. Would that be right? Yes, that, that would be correct. Yeah. Uh, and I wonder if you could comment on, um, I guess, the side effect profile. And I'm thinking particularly about the impact on, on um, weight gain, perhaps, but also sexual dysfunction, and particularly for someone like Tom, where we might get erectile dysfunction as a side effect of SSRI. Sure. Look, I think one of the difficulties about the assessment of sexual side effects and antidepressants is that often the first time somebody reports sexual dysfunction is as medication has been, after medication has been commenced. But when you take a history of the sexual dysfunction, it actually predated the uh, prescription of antidepressants. And somebody who's feeling ashamed, who's lost identity, who's feeling um, less powerful in a relationship will often have sexual dysfunction as part of that. And that's not to avoid that, I mean there is a very definite link between um, sexual dysfunction and particularly SSRIs. There are a number of newer antidepressants which are less likely to cause sexual dysfunction. Um, there's a, an antidepressant that's come onto the market in Australia in the last few years called vortioxetine, um, meclobamide, which has been around for some years, agamelatine. Um, but I don't think in the case of agamelatine or meclobamide, they really have a strongly established evidence base in the treatment of PTSD. But nevertheless, I will sometimes change patients um, from an SSRI to one of those other agents. Um, Weight gain is generally less of an issue on the SSRIs, um, although I think again there's inter-individual inter variation there. Uh, weight gain tends to particularly happen with the atypical antipsychotics such as quetiapine, which is prescribed quite commonly to treat nightmares. Um, there has been some uh, work in the last 10 years to do with non-psychotropic agents having a role in the treatment of arousal and nightmares, things like clonidine, prazosin, 
But again, I think the, um, the evidence base is not firmly established. Um, but nevertheless, I will sometimes use those medications where somebody's uh, been intolerant of the psychotropic agents and uh, trial them on the non-psychotropic agents to see if that reduces arousal. But that requires quite a lot of monitoring, particularly of blood pressure with prazosin and clonidine. Mm. Yeah, okay. It's a complex issue, isn't it? Mm. Um, and to turn to you, Kate, if I could, you mentioned a number of things, um, I guess relatively quickly, but things that I think are crucial. But I wonder how important you think they are. I, mean, I'm, I guess I'm thinking about more lifestyle kinds of things social engagement being a big one, but also things like exercise and diet and rest and so on. How important do you think these things are in, in, in someone like Tom? I actually think they're really, uh, really, really important. So, you know, those, you know, when we eat well, when we get some sunshine, when we exercise a bit, when we engage with people, we, we, you know, it, it has a very positive effect on mood. Um, so, you know, and a lot of those things will drop out of the person's life as they feel worse. So I actually have a what I call a, a wellbeing script and I go through it with people and I've, I've typed it all up and I can actually, we can write on there where there perhaps um, some changes can be made um, and from there then go to some, you know, basic goal setting. And I find people respond to that really well. So making it very meaningful and concrete. Um, yeah. So, yeah. I, I, I absolutely agree. I think that, that um, things like that can make a huge difference. And, and um, yeah, re-engaging, re re enjoyable activities and things like that. And I think, you know, just to, I do think sometimes that we as clinicians, um, so, sort of get involved in very high level therapies and we think they're really great and it's a, you know, and we sometimes forget about these things that are actually so important starting points, you know, lay that basis. I'm often struck by the, as I understand it, the literature on depression that says, you know, yeah. behavioural activation is far and away the most important thing. Get people doing yeah. things, you know, so basic kind of stuff. Yeah. A couple of recent examples, um, you know, a woman with anxiety, uh, lots of, you know, lots of issues, but when we went through that script, she, um, she was drinking two litres of Coca-Cola every day and, you know, there's a lot of caffeine and sugar in, in Coke and, you know, she actually felt a lot better when she changed what she was drinking as her main fluid. Um, yeah. Someone else who's, um, you know, depressed, someone like Tom, if he actually manages to get out and walk the dog around the block in the sunshine or get out into nature, uh, you know, Townsville, there's some beautiful spots go for a walk along the seafront or something, it, you know, it, take the kids. It may well um, do a, a lot of good for his mood. Absolutely, absolutely. And we've got a mounting body of evidence, haven't we, around the benefits of uh, physical exercise generally in mental health. While I've got you, Kate, um, and we are running out of time. We've only got a few minutes left. So very briefly, uh, and I know it's a big issue, but would you want to involve Tom's partner in treatment? Should we be involving his, his partner? Uh, yes, very much so. Um, I think, uh, you know, it says that Tom, well, I'm presuming Tom goes to the GP. He may well go with Sonia in the first instance. It's not uncommon for a husband and wife to turn up or a part, you know, partners to come together. Um, and so, you know, it's important to see Tom obviously on his own as well. But, but for Sonia, um, uh, you know, information is important, understanding uh, what's happening for Tom, um, obviously with his consent. Um, but also she may well need therapy as well and support. And so, it, you know, it may be that um, she needs to see her GP and, you know, perhaps see a therapist herself or counsellor or, you know, get some of that support as well. Absolutely, and it's, it's um, yeah, I think it is an interesting, well, I was going to say dilemma, that's not the right word, but, but how much we're seeing the partner so that they can help the veteran and how much we're seeing the partner actually because of problems that he or she has. But Yeah, good point. Okay, final question before I, I begin to wind things up, and I might chuck this one at you, uh, John, if I could. We've talked a bit about the lack of um, 
Well, the difficulty, I guess, in rural and remote areas of, of getting access to treatment. Uh, John, do you have any um, uh, suggestions about what we can do in terms of perhaps online internet-based treatments? Have we got any evidence that they are helpful? We, we do have uh, evidence that they are helpful, and in particular, I guess, cognitive processing therapy. I have my, must declare my bias. Um, uh, there, there's a number of research studies done in the US that show that they actually have equal outcomes to face-to-face -face, um, counselling. And, and in, in fact, even in groups done on the internet, which I find really surprising, but even in groups done on the internet, they have uh, outcomes that are the same. And they also have better bonding across the internet, which one with my biases about that. Isn't it? Yeah. it seems to be, but yeah. So yeah. there is there is research that shows that it that it can work, uh, and certainly uh, from what I know of the U.S. context, which would be very similar here, it was it was developed in the U.S. because of those difficulties for people in rural and remote areas. Yeah, so that is very encouraging. But just to be clear, there you're talking about um, a therapist working online through Skype or or something like that. Is that right? Um, yeah, absolutely. There's there's not much evidence in terms of somebody doing a, a sort of structured program that, that might be like a, a, an online education program, having yeah. that opportunity to get feedback from a therapist and understand the experience and uh, understand um, where, where your kind of beliefs go that have been changed through traumatic experiences is something that the therapist is a key for that. Yeah. Absolutely. Still, no doubt we will uh, continue to see a growth, I guess, in online and, and technologically based treatments. Um, but alas, we're running out of time. We really only have a couple of minutes left. And so I would like to, if I could, ask each of our panelists whether they have one or two uh, take home messages that they'd like to leave our participants with. And perhaps if I could start with you, Kate, is there any, any final messages you'd like to leave our participants with? Uh, I think, um, think holistically, there's my dog in the background making an appearance. Mm -hmm. So, you know, people have all sorts of um, aspects to their lives. So, you know, think about um, all of the problems, but also think of all the many facets to Tom's life. Um, and I think, you know, if you can uh, create a team around Tom, that's going to be most helpful. Great. Okay, thanks for that. And it's very nice to see your dog wandering around in the yeah. back there. <laughs> John, uh, any, any take home messages from you for, for our participants tonight? I guess the take home message for me would be that uh, you know, the evidence based therapies are really good. They, they work very well and the, the key that, that they have is that they are trauma focused and that's a, that's a really important thing. And, and I guess in terms of thinking about the holistic thing that, the, that Kate has mentioned, the holistic idea, we might be engaging with the GP, with the psychiatrist, helping the client move towards an evidence-based treatment that's trauma-focused. That can be a difficult thing to think about to start with, but if a team is there, that can be helpful. So into, interacting with your team for the veteran is, is good, and uh, evidence-based therapies have that uh, edge in terms of that trauma focus that helps people change things significantly. Lovely. Thanks, John. And Mary, any uh, final take-home messages from you? Yeah, look, I, I think I'm uh, just endorsing the messages of the others, but it's really kind of the C words, collaborate, communicate and care. And I think uh, sometimes we, you know, we open this discussion around entitlement and sometimes the Toms of this world can have a very abrasive quality that puts us off and makes it hard to care for them. And so sometimes finding your way in and finding the sort of, you know, the softy, the marshmallow inside um, uh, can be really helpful to then be able to better care for Tom as well as obviously the collaboration and communication. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Thank you very much to all of you. Uh, look, I've just got a few very quick closing comments to make. Uh, first of all, a reminder to everybody that MHPN runs uh, local networks and uh, in particular a number of networks that are specifically oriented to, towards veterans' mental health. So uh, for more information about those, you can join a network or indeed if you'd like to start one, uh, do contact MHPN. Uh, a reminder, as I said at the beginning, that there are a number of resources uh, to go along with this webinar tonight and MHPN will send you a link 
to all of those resources so that you can access them. Uh, but for now, uh, it's really time to sign off and say thank you. Uh, I would ask you please to make sure that you complete the feedback survey uh, before you log off. Um, but basically, thank you very much to everyone for what I thought was a great webinar. This is the uh, last activity in this particular stream of the MHPN online conference. And tonight's activity will be up uh, on the website, I think, uh, in, in around 24 hours. So thank you very much to MHPN, to DVA, and to Redback for their support of this and other webinars in this series. Thanks very much to our panel tonight, to Kate, to John, and to Mary. And thank you very much to all of you participants for your involvement and engagement in the webinar. Thanks very much, and good night to everybody.